Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of January 2023. The first paper for today is the difunctionalization of aryl grignards through a reported heterobimetallic species, using both titanium as well as iron. This chemistry features the difunctionalization of arenes in a regioselective fashion through the addition of two electrophiles or alternatively a nucleophile in the presence of an oxidant as well as a second electrophile. Now you might be wondering how this chemistry works. So initially they have a Grignard reagent and this can undergo transmetallation with titanium to afford a titanium bound product. Now the mechanism here isn't super clear. The authors do elucidate the structure of some heterobimetallic species that formed in their mixtures. They confirm that by NMR as well as HRMS, although that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the mechanism that the reaction is going through. It just means that it's a mechanism that the reaction may go through. So once this titanium species is formed, deprotonation of the ortho position is accomplished using a mesetyl grignard, and then presumably the iron undergoes transmetallation to afford the new heterobimetallic species featuring both titanium and iron. So once this bimetallic species is formed, the iron substituted center reacts faster. So the first electrophile that's added will go there. And the second electrophile will go to the center where the titanium is bound. Some electrophiles that can be used include ethyl chloroformate, alkyl iodides. You can use CO2 if you want to get a carboxylic acid. And the authors even prepared phosphine oxides, as well as substituted anilines from the corresponding N-chloroamines. I was amused to see the authors report these amine groups, and I immediately went to their SI to see how they did this. And of course they used N-chloroamines, which I was still a little bit surprised to see if I'm completely honest. The functional group tolerance of this chemistry appears to be quite good. There are many other examples in the full manuscript, and I would encourage you to check that out. So this is just using two electrophiles, but what if you want to add in one nucleophile and one electrophile? So the authors do this as well using heteroaryl grignards or aryl grignards. I didn't show too many examples of that here because you get the point. You can add in a Grignard and then you can do the subsequent addition of Electrophile to substitute the Titanium Center to get the corresponding products. Now in terms of which Organometallic Center was more reactive, the authors were familiar with Titanium and Iron Chemistry and they were able to observe that the Iron Center would preferentially react first. Here you can see this addition of a Nucleophile with an Aryl Grignard. Earlier I mentioned that there was an oxidant. You might be wondering what the oxidant is. Here it's just 1,2-dichloroethane, which is kind of interesting to see used as an oxidant. And then they use D2O to quench the resulting organometallic, and you can see that 98% deuterium incorporation was seen at the titanium center, showing that the iron center really is the most reactive. Now when they explore other electrophiles, such as this N-chloromorpholine, they get the morpholine substituted product where the iron center was. Similarly, if they use a benzyl chloride, they get benzylation incorporation to that center, and finally, if they were to transmetallate the iron center using copper and treat it with benzoyl chloride, they would get the corresponding benzophenone. Now, whether or not the copper is actually undergoing transmetallation and is involved for this reaction is up to your interpretation. In addition to the examples I showed before, the authors demonstrated some other complex examples, such as in the synthesis of this naphthoquinone, plumbigan, ethyl olive tolate, as well as these other complex examples. So I really like this paper. I'd like to see this type of chemistry get used more especially since they were able to undergo difunctionalization of an existing Grignard, which would normally be only used as something you react with carbonyls in your typical Grignard reaction. And when they used their mesetyl Grignard to do deprotonations, they didn't see any halogen exchange for their aryl chloride or their aryl bromide. And so I thought that that was quite impressive, but not quite as impressive as today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Reaxis. Reaxis is my preferred chemistry information system for searching chemical reactions and related literature. They also have a free app for iOS and Android called Reaction Flash. Reaction Flash is an app with over 1,000 named reactions in organic chemistry, and you can quiz yourself on how these reactions work, what reactants are used, and what sorts of products are formed. I have specifically used Reaction Flash as a way to learn more reactions that may help me come up with new ideas for my research. The app allows you to view the mechanism of named reactions, test your knowledge with an interactive quiz, and search through numerous specific examples of these reactions from peer-reviewed literature. Thousands of students and researchers already use Reaction Flash. Reaction Flash is a great app as an up-to-date reference and learning tool for chemical reactions, so why not download it today and give it a try? You can download it on iOS or Android by clicking the link in the description. That way they'll know you came from here. I'd like to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel.
The second paper for today is the direct deaminative functionalization of various amines. This is a further extension of some of the work from the Levin group. And the highlights of this paper are that they converted amines and anilines into the corresponding bromides, thioethers, phosphonates, as well as alcohols. So to give you a bit of an overview, the way that this chemistry works is they start with their amine, they react it with this anomeric amide, compound 1. I'd like to officially call this compound Levin's reagent, effective immediately. What this does is it generates an isodiazine, and what they wanted to do in this paper is get a radical chain process to get an isodiazine radical, which could then eliminate nitrogen to form a carbon-centered radical, and that carbon-centered radical could capture oxygen, it could capture a disulfide, it could capture a phosphite, or alternatively, it could capture a bromine from carbon tetrabromide. And so this is what they do in this paper. I'll just briefly talk a little bit more about the mechanism here in case you didn't catch that. So once this isodiazine radical is formed using their chemistry, this is able to eliminate nitrogen, forming a carbon-centered radical. This is able to abstract a bromine from carbon tetrabromide, generating a tribromomethyl radical species, which is able to propagate the chain reaction. So the key step for this chemistry is that they needed to have chain propagation to occur so that all of the chemistry could keep happening. Now, in terms of some of the highlights for the bromination, this was able to work for both aliphatic as well as aryl amines to afford the corresponding bromobenzenes or alkyl bromides, respectively. They demonstrated that this worked on complex examples with various functional groups, and it really highlights the utility of this anomeric amide 1. In addition to bromonations, they were able to do thiolations and phosphonylations. Here you can see the thioethers that they were able to form from aryl disulfides. Now I'm sure that this would be bigger if there was more commercially available disulfides, but alas, they still demonstrate that this works with several different aniline derivatives. Personally, I would be curious if this works with aliphatic amines, but since the synthesis of alkyl thioethers is relatively straightforward due to the high nucleophilicity of thiolates, these compounds could likely be prepared through alternative means. In terms of the phosphonylations, they were able to use triethyl phosphite, presumably through the generation of an ethyl radical, and the ethyl radical would be propagating the chain reaction. Now, I personally was a little bit surprised that an ethyl radical could be formed from triethyl phosphite, but nonetheless, it was cool to see this as a new method for synthesizing phosphonates. Last but not least, the authors examined the use of elemental oxygen as a trap for radicals. Once oxygen is captured by the carbon radical, this forms an endoperoxide radical, and this endoperoxide is able to get reduced using triphenylphosphine, forming triphenylphosphine oxide and the corresponding alcohol. So honestly, this chemistry is pretty mild. This is all room temperature chemistry, and they're just able to convert amines directly into the corresponding alcohols. Now, while the authors don't report the synthesis of phenols, I'd be interested to know if this chemistry worked for the synthesis of phenols from anilines, because that would also be kind of a cool transformation. You can see in instance 9, rather than allowing the conversion to 8F, they also isolated this endoperoxide in the absence of triphenylphosphine. So again, this was another really impressive paper, and I look forward to seeing what people do with this chemistry in the future. The third paper for today is the difunctionalization of alkenes using imine sulfonylation. The highlights of this paper include the photochemical amino sulfonylation of alkenes, and they utilize thioxanthone as a photocatalyst. The mechanism of this chemistry is as follows. The photocatalyst is excited from its ground state to an excited state. This is the thioxanthone we talked about earlier. This is then able to do an energy transfer from the reagent 3 to an excited state, shown here. This excited state is then able to transfer a sulfonyl radical, generating a carbon-centered radical, and through radical recombination, they're forwarded with the imine sulfonylated product. Alternatively, if they didn't want to trap this with an imine, they can use a hydrogen atom transfer reagent, such as a thiol, to get the hydrogen substituted product instead. Now, occasionally when they were making these, they were running into some issues with hydrolysis of the imine on silica, or alternatively, there was some difficulties isolating the sulfonyl fluorides because these are just a little bit reactive. So in some instances, what they did is they substituted the fluoride with another nucleophile just so that it was a little bit easier to do workup. Some examples of the sulfonyl fluorides that they isolated are shown here. Several different examples with complex functional groups were tolerated. Here you can see some examples where they isolated the sulfonate derivatives of these instead of the unfunctionalized sulfonyl fluoride. Now in terms of this reagent 3, this is actually straightforward to synthesize. They cite an old method that's reported in the literature, starting with chlorosulfonyl isocyanate, which is commercially available. This is prepared in one step from sulfur trioxide and cyanogen chloride. And then what they do is they substitute the chlorine with a fluorine using sodium fluoride. 
They distill out the new fluorosulfonyl isocyanate, and then this is reacted with benzophenone, and the product can be crystallized without doing any chromatography. So this is another really cool paper. The synthesis of sulfonyl fluorides in this fashion was quite impressive to me. Additionally, you get that free nitrogen installation. Who knows what you could do using the new Levin chemistry as well if you wanted to start making analogs of that. I think this chemistry is pretty cool, and we've had a really great month for good papers so far. Let's talk about the next one. The fourth paper for today is decarboxylative functionalization through the use of iron and copper co-catalysis. Some highlights of this paper include decarboxylative amination, although this was limited to the use of anilines. This chemistry features both the use of copper and iron as co-catalysts, and additionally the authors show that Michael acceptors could be used as radical sinks. So this photochemical process enables the elongation of a carbon chain if you use a Michael acceptor. Alternatively, you can convert a carboxylic acid to the corresponding amine using this method. So the proposed mechanism of this chemistry is as follows. The initial iron is oxidized using ditert-butyl peroxide to generate an oxidized iron intermediate, which is able to convert a carboxylic acid to the corresponding carboxyl radical. This can then undergo decarboxylation to generate a carbon-centered radical. Meanwhile, an aniline is able to coordinate to copper 2. This can be deprotonated via DBU. And this copper 2 species is able to capture the carbon radical, generating a copper 3 species. Reductive elimination can then occur, forming the substituted aniline product. And finally, the copper 1 is able to be oxidized back to copper 2 through the use of ditert-butyl peroxide. Now, some highlights of the scope are as followed. They also varied the aniline in the full manuscript, although since they're relatively straightforward products, I figured I could exclude them just for convenience. Here you can see several different carboxylic acid analogs were used with various functional groups to prepare the corresponding amines. They even did an analog of this chemotherapy agent shown here, which I thought was quite impressive, and I wonder if the corresponding author for this paper was aware that this experiment was being done. Now, in addition to the amination, if they had only done the amination, this paper probably wouldn't have made the cutoff. But because they reacted this with several different Michael acceptors, I thought that this chemistry was pretty cool. So what they do here is they use different Michael acceptors, alpha, beta, unsaturated, carbonyl, or related compounds. And by using different Michael acceptors, they can make different analogs where the decarboxylation has occurred, and they've just extended this by a few carbons. Now, they did a lot of examples in this paper with acrolein. And again, I wonder if the corresponding author for this paper was aware that this much acrolein was being used in their lab. Nonetheless, I think the use of acrolein in this context is pretty cool, as you might not traditionally think to synthesize these compounds through an approach such as this. So a cool approach to elongate carbon chains, and I look forward to seeing how this chemistry also gets used. The fifth paper for today is another decarboxylation. In this case, we have decarboxylative difluoroalkylation. Some highlights of this paper include photochemical decarboxylative difluoroalkylation of Michael acceptors, mediated through the use of acrodinium in photochemistry. Difluoro compounds are of high value, and oftentimes it can be challenging to regioselectively introduce difluoro groups. If you use deoxyfluorinating agents such as DAST, you can often have that reacting with lots of other functional groups, and in addition to the desired difluoroalkane, you can often undergo elimination to form the corresponding vinyl fluorides. The mechanism of this chemistry is as follows. They deprotonate their carboxylic acid using potassium phosphate. This is then able to undergo decarboxylation from the excited photocatalyst. The difluoroalkyl radical can then be captured by a Michael acceptor, and the resulting carbon-centered radical can be reduced from the acrodinium radical anion, reducing it back to the ground state acrodinium catalyst. And this generates an anion, which can just be protonated, affording the final product. The structure of the acrodinium that they used for some of this chemistry is shown here. Some highlights of this paper include the use of various different Michael acceptors and different fluorinated carboxylic acids. You can see that not only do difluorobenzyl groups work, they can use aliphatic difluoroalkanes as well. And this enabled them to synthesize interesting libraries of amino acid derivatives. Now, in addition to the difluoroalkylation of Michael acceptors, they were also able to do monofluoroalkylation by using alpha monofluorocarboxylic acids. Here are some examples of different amino acid derivatives that they were able to synthesize using this protocol. And if you're familiar with fluorine chemistry, I think you'll find this synthetic approach quite appealing, especially given the mild conditions that are required. All we have is a Michael acceptor in the presence of a photocatalyst under room temperature photochemical conditions, and we have rapid synthesis of fluorinated amino acid derivatives. Deprotect these and you're good to go. So this is another really cool paper. 
you may or may not know this, but I am a fluorine chemist, so I thought I should probably include at least one fluorine paper from time to time. If you want to see more fluorine chemistry in the future, make sure you let me know down in the comments, as your feedback matters for this series. We have many honorable mentions for this month as well, and I'd encourage you to check out those papers as there's some other really cool chemistry that didn't make the cutoff for this video. So hopefully you've enjoyed this month's episode of Important Papers. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.